Praise God. Thank you. Thank you, guys. Appreciate it very much. God is good and his mercy endures forever. God is a good God, amen? And his mercy endures forever. Thank God for it. Thank you for the band. Thank you for the singer. But God is good, amen? I pray you had a great Christmas. We certainly did at our house. It was a wonderful time. Got together with family. And, and if you did or if you didn't, I, I trust that you were able to spend some time with the Lord on, the, on a day that we really believe is a very special and important day. Uh, this coming week, we turn from one year to another, and this is a very important time for all of us. We make uh, New Year's resolutions. We think of things we should have done and didn't do and things that we will do that we plan on doing, and this is a time we, we decide to get rid of things we ought not be involved in and get involved in things we ought have gotten involved in last year. We have all these thoughts going through our minds, so come to church and get encouraged because sometimes this is the time the devil wants to beat people up and get them depressed and get them down on themselves, and, and, and sometimes we get calls in the office or I get calls myself, people that are being depressed or down, so come to church. That's where you need to come, and you'll get lifted up and encouraged, amen? amen. You'll get lifted up and encouraged tomorrow at 6 o'clock over at State Street, we'll be meeting in the larger room. Uh, not the room that we normally meet in on Wednesday, but uh, another room that we have available to us. It'll be a larger room, and we can all get in there. We'll be able to have our candlelight service, and it'll be a one-hour service from 6 o'clock till 7 o'clock. And we do that because we don't want to have to face all the drunks that are on the road later on. And also, if you have family uh, get-togethers on, on New Year's and New Year's Day, uh, you'll be able to enjoy worshiping God and honoring God with uh, praise and worship, with, with uh, hearing the Word of God uh, read to you about how important the light of the world is, and then communion. It's a glorious and a wonderful time. It's a great way to start out the new year. Say goodbye to the old year and hello to the new year. And it's only a one-hour service. So you can come from 6 o'clock to 7 o'clock. You can plan on being out of there about 7.15. For some of you who like to visit, about 8 o'clock because you'll be talking and visiting but normally it's an hour from 6 to 7, and then you go home and have your own family function. I know we do at our house, and it's always a great, great time getting together with fellow believers. So tomorrow night will be the larger room. We'll have the candlelight service, and we'll be able to uh, pray together, receive Holy Communion together. There'll be a, some special music, and then we'll be having some praise and worship. It'll be a wonderful time. Turn to somebody and say, I'll see you there one night. I hope you will. Randy, I love what you said, you know, you want more of God this next year. And I wrote down this, and God wants more of you this year. This next year, God always wants more of us. Amen? Uh, this is the last, this is part five in a series that we've been on in our Christmas series. And you say, well, Christmas is over. Yeah, it is, but the stories that we'll be talking about are, are stories that were after the birth of Jesus Christ, but yet had to do with the Christmas story, and we can learn some truth, some truth from what we hear from these Christmas stories. But first of all, I want to remind you what the title of our series has been, and that is uh, the Christmas story tells us that God is not the problem, he's the answer. And that's really important because in the society we live in today, religion is the problem. You know, secularism is okay, it's religion that's caused all the wars, it's religion that's caused all the problems. You'll hear that taught, you'll hear that uh, spoken about, you'll hear that uh, pushed in different places. Listen, God is not the problem. God is the answer, amen? That's usually a good place to say amen when someone says God is not the problem, God's the answer. So here, let me try it again. I want to try it again. Well, uh, not, not ahead of time. You're getting ready. Are you getting ready? God is not the problem, God is the answer. Amen. All right, there we go. Good, good. That's good. The reason we go through that a couple of times, and we've been going through that for five different lessons, this will be the fifth lesson, is because people get that mixed up. Sometimes we, we get mixed up because we've been lied to. We've been told lies from people who didn't really understand themselves that God is the problem. When bad things happen, God caused that tornado, God caused that flood, God caused that death, God caused that disease, God caused that uh, job to be lost. And we blame God for everything bad. And pretty soon we start to get upset with God and mad at God. And we have a tendency to then want to pull away from God and ignore God, not come to church, not read the Bible, not pray, not, not spend time with the Lord. We don't even want to talk about God. Mom and dad believed in God and looked what happened. And because we blame God, we think God did it. But that, according to the Bible, is what the Bible calls lack of knowledge. Now in the world, we'd call that ignorance. Ignorance is just simply lack of knowledge. For instance, I don't know a whole lot about, uh, you know, rockets and things like that. So I'm very ignorant when it comes to that. 
uh, you know, in some subjects in school, I did well. In some subjects, I did okay. But I forgot a lot of what I took when I was in school. So you could say I was ig- I'm ignorant now about those subjects because I, 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 I need to be refreshed in them. I need to know them. Ignorance is simply the lack of knowledge. A lot of times, somebody can be really smart on an item or an area in their lives and really ignorant or lack of knowledge in another area. That's why a lot of times professors in, in college and things can teach us wonderful things, and they taught me wonderful things, and I'm sure they taught you. They can teach us wonderful things because they have a lot of knowledge in certain areas. But when it comes to spiritual areas, some of the greatest professors and greatest teachers and greatest colleges are ignorant when it comes to spiritual things. It's not that they're stupid, they're just ignorant when it comes to spiritual things. For instance, they have knowledge in areas that I'm ignorant in. We have knowledge in spiritual things that they're ignorant in. So we never let people that are ignorant or lack of knowledge in the spiritual area tell us about God. We should always be able to tell them about God and let them tell us about science and things like that. Amen? See, God talks about that because sometimes we get mad at God. God did this. God did that. I'm mad at God. God caused that to happen. God caused my parents to get divorced. God caused this to happen. God caused that disease. God caused that sickness. God caused this. God caused, and we get mad, and we blame God. Again, it's lack of knowledge. And the Bible tells us, uh, God tells us in Hosea, he says, my people are destroyed because of lack of knowledge, another ignorance. Ignorance. We don't understand what's really going on, so we blame God, and we don't understand things. Uh, Jesus said it this way. He said, you'll know the truth, and the truth will set you free. See, we need to know the truth, and we need to have knowledge. Otherwise, we're ignorant, and we blame God for things we ought not blame God for. And I'm not saying you're stupid. I would not uh, insult you that way at all. I would not even go down that path, nor does my mind even reach those thoughts. I think you're intelligent. I think each and every person in this room probably has very intelligent in different areas. But sometimes you and I get taken in. We start to get mad at God, and the Bible says, God says, my people are destroyed because of lack of knowledge. We need to know about God. We need to know the truth. The Bible says this, that God is not the problem. The Bible says, this is where we get knowledge, that Satan is the problem. You know, the Bible says that Satan is evil or bad. Now, this is important that we know this. The Bible says that Satan is a taker. The Bible says this, be sober and be vigilant, for your adversary, the devil, goes around like a roaring lion seeking who he may devour. The Bible tells us that we have an enemy, we have have an adversary, but it's not God. The Bible says it's Satan who goes around, he's bad, and he's a taker, he wants to devour. The Bible tells us in John 10.10, the thief, he's talking about Satan, comes not but to steal to kill and destroy. See, God's not the problem. The Bible tells us that Satan is the problem. The Bible goes on to tell us that Satan is a liar. He'll blame, do something to you and blame God. If I could do something to you and then blame God and you would be mad at God, or I could do something to you and blame Gary over here and you'd be mad at Gary, that'd be great. I could do things to you all the time and blame Gary. You'd always be mad at Gary. And I'd be ripping you off and taking advantage of you and I'd always be blaming Gary. You'd be mad at Gary. And that's what the devil is. The Bible says he's a destroyer, he's someone who comes to devour and steal, and he's also a liar. He does those things, and then he blames God. God is not the problem, God is the answer. Whereas Satan is a taker, whereas Satan is bad, God is good, and God is a giver. God is not a taker, God is a giver. Satan takes and steals, he's a thief, but God is a giver. And that's what Christmas says. Christmas says God gave his son, Jesus Christ, so we could have a Savior. So you and I would have someone who died for our sins and we could receive eternal life. Satan wants to condemn and take your joy. God wants to bless you and give you joy. The same verse that tells us that Satan is a thief and the taker tells us that God is a giver. Jesus said it. He says, for the thief comes not but to steal, to kill and destroy. And then he talks about him and his father. He says, but I have come to give. Say this with me. God is a giver. giver. Satan is a taker. See, anytime in your life you see something taken, don't blame God. Satan is the taker. Now, hold on. This is knowledge. We can be ignorant and not know this because maybe we never studied it. But let's get some intelligence in this. Let's get some knowledge in this. Satan is the taker. You can't blame my God. Satan, you've taken. And God is the giver. Say God is the giver. The Bible says, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, 
that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life. The Bible tells us that God is a giver and Satan is a taker. That God is good and always will be good and Satan is bad and always will be bad. We need to understand that and get that knowledge within us today. We're going to look at the Christmas story one more time. This will be the last time we'll be looking at it this year and the last time really in this series that we have. But we want to end with this particular lesson because I think it's important for our future and for our planning in our own lives. Uh, what we found out is this. God says my people are destroyed because of lack of knowledge. Now a lot of people have knowledge of the Bible story of Jesus' birth. They know about Mary, they know about Joseph, they know about the wise men, they know about the star, they know about the shepherds, and that's knowledge. That's what we call general knowledge of the, of the Bible. But then there's wisdom within wisdom, or knowledge within knowledge. In other words, God puts knowledge in the Bible, and then there's knowledge that if you're not careful, you'll miss. Because God has different layers of knowledge. He teaches on so many different layers. And that's why the Bible says uh, precept must be upon precept. Precept upon precept, line upon line, here a little, there a little. He says, when you look at it, you're going to learn something. Then you're going to go a little deeper. Then you're going to go a little deeper. Then you're going to go a little deeper, and you'll learn more and more and more. Today, we want to take a look. I really only have two points today, and you can say amen, amen. We really only have two points today. Of course, each point is going to take about an hour and a half, so about a three-hour service, but we only have two points. But they're really important points, and we're going to learn these points as you see from the Christmas story, it's always been there. It's always been there in the Christmas story, but maybe you and I have missed it. We're going to look at two points that I believe, if you look at it, you'll say, oh my goodness, it's in the Christmas story. I've heard this since I was little. I've heard the Christmas story, but I've never saw this. And that is because God puts wisdom within wisdom, knowledge within knowledge, precept upon precept, line upon line. We learn, and then we learn, and then we learn. So today, the first point, if you're taking notes, is simply this. God has a plan for your life. doesn't matter what age you are. God has a plan for your life. When we look at the Bible and the Christmas story, I just want to remind you that Zacharias was an old man. And God had a plan for his life. He said, Zacharias, your wife Elizabeth is going to become pregnant, and you're going to give birth to a child, and that child is going to be the forerunner of the Savior. God had a plan for Zacharias, and John, God had a plan for Elizabeth. In fact, God had a plan for their son, John, who became John the Baptist. God had a plan for the shepherds. The shepherds thought, all oh, we are the shepherds. We just watch sheep. But God had a plan for their lives. They didn't know about. They didn't even suspect. But God had a plan for their lives. He had them where they were at for a reason. He had them in the fields where they were at for a reason. He had it all planned out, and they were there for a reason. God had a plan for the wise men, and God has a plan for you. The Bible says in Jeremiah chapter 29 and verse 11, For I know the thoughts that I think toward you, saith the Lord, thoughts of peace, it's not of evil, it says, to give you an expected end, God says, I've got an expected end. I've got a plan for your life. I have a plan. If you'll follow me, you're going to be blessed. If you'll listen to me, I know you're going to be blessed. Somebody said, well, how is it possible? There's millions and billions of people in the world. How is it possible that God could have a plan for each one of our lives? It is possible because, see, the Bible says anything's possible with God or nothing's impossible with God or all things are possible with God. It goes through and goes through and reminds us that with God all things are possible. But let's talk about this for a moment. It was snowing the other day. I walked out and saw some flakes coming down. I was reminded of this. When I was a young man, I remember reading our little uh, weekly reader we had in school and in there I read and I haven't heard anything different since in fact I've read it since it said that snowflakes none of the two snowflakes are the same they all have different shapes have you ever heard that how could all those thousands millions and billions of snowflakes not two of them look the same in fact I remember reading that our fingerprints are all different and that's how you can find a criminal and find out if you've done something because they'll you know, they'll dust it and check for your fingerprints and see if it was you or see who it was because all of our fingerprints are different. How is it possible that billions of billions of fingers in this world and none of our fingerprints are the same? They're all different? Uh, how about this? They tell us that our DNA is different. 
that if you and I are related and we have relatives, we can be close, but all of our DNA are different. That my markers and my DNA are different than your markers and your DNA. And we go, how is it possible with all the people that are in the world that all of us have the separate DNA, different fingerprints? And, and they tell me that you and I could set up a safe in our house and we could put a scan on there and we just put our eye scan. And they could scan our eye and that's how it opened. I could put my eye there, it wouldn't open if it was set for yours. If it was set for mine, you could put your eye there and it wouldn't open because all of our eyes have different markers. All of our fingers have different fingerprints. All the snowflakes have different shapes to them. And all of our DNA is different. Well, how is it possible that God has a plan for all of us? If you can explain to me how those snowflakes are all different, if you can explain to me how our fingerprints are all different, if you can explain to me how our DNA is all different, if you can explain to me how our eyes being scanned are all different, then I can explain to you how God could have a plan for everybody. But why don't we just say this, nothing's impossible with God. Amen? And nothing is. Uh, now the thing is, is God has a plan for all of our lives. But you and I choose to either follow God's plan or follow our plan. At the end of one year, getting ready to enter into the new year, it's really important to think about this. God definitely has a plan for each one of our lives, but it's really up to us whether we choose to go our way or God's way, whether we choose to follow this plan or God's plan. Now, before we choose which way to go, I want to remind you of this. God's plans are seen down through history. He sees what's going to happen in the future. He knows what happened in the past. So when he plans something for you, he knows all the things that are going to come up in your life. He sees all the way down. He sees in the future far. His plans are based not just on today, whereas our plans usually are. It's not just based on a year or two years or 10 years or 20 years or 30 years. God's plans are based for you and I for all eternity. So he makes his plans based not just on what college you're going to go to today, but what job you'll be working in the future, where you're going to be, in, if you're going to have kids. He knows all those things. So when he's trying to guide us and lead us and try to give us a plan, he's, he knows. He's planning way ahead of time. So that tells me this, God's plans are better than our plans. They really are. When you look at the Bible, we find this out. And I, I mentioned this before, but let me say this again. Moses. Moses had made a mistake. If you ever made a mistake, uh, turn to your neighbor and say, he made a mistake. And I read somewhere that uh, there are people who don't want to admit that they're wrong. And I think that's terrible that you all don't want to admit you're wrong. I've never had that problem. I mean, being wrong. But God had plans for different people, and they're always better. Moses, for instance. Moses in the Bible, some of you may remember Moses in the Bible. Moses had messed up, and Moses' his plan was to hide on the backside of the desert. God's plan for Moses was to lead three million people out of bondage. What a different set of plans. David, his plan is a young man was to be a good shepherd like his family and be a, the best shepherd he could be. God's plan, talk about better plans, was for David to be a king and shepherd a whole nation. God's plans are better. There's a man in the Bible called Gideon, and Gideon's plan, he, there was an enemy that had taken over the country, and his plan was to hide from the enemy. God's plan for Gideon was to lead his nation to victory over the enemy. God's plans are always better than our plans. Peter Peter in the Bible, his plan was to be a, a great fisherman, like his dad, fisherman, and they had to raise his sons, and they would be fishermen, fishermen and sons, Pete and sons. But God had a different plan. He wanted Peter to be a fisher of men. He wanted Peter to become a great, become a great apostle, to write two of the books in the Bible and to influence millions and millions of people's lives down through history. God's plans are always better than our plans. The apostle Paul, he had, he had a plan. His plan was to kill Christians. God had a plan to have Paul and use him to lead millions of people to Christianity. God's plans are always better than our plans. In the Bible story, there's Joseph and Mary. They had a plan. Well, they were going to get married. Joseph had asked Mary to marry him, and Mary had said yes. And they had, they had planned to raise children together. God had a plan that they would raise the Savior of the world together. God's plans always better than our plans. Amen. 
I want you to look at someone and say to them, square in the eye, say, God has a plan for your life. And it is better than any plan that you have. What college you'll go to, we'll decide just on if we can get the uh, scholarships. We'll decide at what's closer. We'll decide if we like somebody going there. Uh, God has a plan on what one we should go to. God has a plan. We can zero in on God's plan. Make sure we ask him, what job should I take? Who should I marry? We should always ask God because God's plans are better. Now here's point number two that we're going we're gonna to spend some time here today because I believe this is so important. What we're about to say right now, I believe the Christmas story answers some things for us. It's this. The more you follow God's plan, the more he'll show you of his plan. The more you follow God's plan, the more he'll show you his plan. So he'll show you more and more of his plan for you as you follow his plan. As you and I take a step to follow God's plan, the more of his plan God will reveal to you and I. The more you and I follow the plan that we know, God will start to reveal more of his plan to us. If we want to know what God has for us, we start doing what we know God wants us to do right now. Uh, Somebody says, what is the plan for my life? Here, let me give you some plans for all of our lives. And as we start following this plan that God has generally for all of us, then God will start revealing the plan he has for you more and more. So if you want to know the plan of God for your life, start following the plan that God has already. For instance, to walk in love. Do you know God actually wants us to walk in love? He wants us to love our neighbors as we love ourselves. In fact, Jesus said, I want you to love your neighbors as I have loved you. That's a plan from God. God wants you and I to actually love our sisters, to love our brothers. It's going to be tough sometimes. Love our mamas and love our daddies. Love the pastor. Love the pastor. Love the pastor. He really wants you to love the pastor. God has a plan that is to love the pastor. He wants you to love the pastor. He really wants... Oh, did I say that already? He... He wants us to love one another. He wants us to love each other. That's a plan from God. You say, I'm waiting for God's plan, and God says, I'm waiting for you to start the plan that I already gave you. He said, but I'm waiting for you to give me the plan for five years. He said, I'm waiting for you to fulfill the one I already gave you five years ago. I want you to love one another. Turn to somebody and say, I've got to love you, and it's going to be hard. Go ahead. God wants us to forgive. Say, I'm waiting for God's plan. And God said, I'm waiting for you to release that unforgiveness. For me to get you to where I want to take you, you got to get rid of the weight that you have on you, and I, I need you to forgive. God says, uh, here's part of the plan. You say, what is it? Love others. Okay. Forgive others. Oh, God wants us to start the plan he's already given us. He wants us to be givers. God is, all the way through, the word of God wants us to give to those that are in need. He wants us to give and help out the word of God and and, and proclaim the word of God. He wants us to be givers. If I'm not working that part of the plan and yet I'm telling God you're not giving me a plan, God's saying you're not working the plan I already gave you. When you and I start following the plan that God has already given us, then he will reveal, reveal more of his plan to us. Uh, be a witness for Jesus Christ. God wants you and I to be a witness. There's part of his plan for you to be a witness. Here's a part of the plan. God wants us to go to church. He says, don't forsake the gathering together of God's people as the manner of some are. He, the devil is a taker. He'll come, across, he'll come into your life and try to get you not to walk in love because that'd be fulfilling God's plan. He'll try to get you not to forgive because that would be fulfilling God's plan. He'll try to get you not to give because that would be fulfilling God's plan. He would try to get you not to come to church because that would be fulfilling God's plan. And the more you follow God's plan, the more of God's plan God will reveal to you and, and the enemy doesn't want you to know the plan. So he'll try to get you to stop doing the things that you should do so you get more of his plan. So we need to decide, I'm going to do what God wants me to do. Amen? When I know he wants me to walk in love, I'm going to walk in love. When when I know he wants me to forgive, I'm going to forgive. When he wants me to give, I'm going to be a giver. When he wants me to, to be a witness, I'm going to witness. When he wants me to go to church, I'll go to church because then I'm fulfilling God's plan. And when I follow God's plan... God will show me and reveal to me more of his plan, and I want to know more of his plan. Somebody who is wise said this to me one time. We were talking about the Bible, and we were were discussing different things about the Bible that I just simply didn't understand. 
And uh, there's things they still don't understand, but I'm talking about a conversation when I was younger. And I was asking questions, and the person said this. He said, it's not, he said, Tim, I want you to always remember this. I said, yes. And he said, it's not the things of the Bible that you don't understand. He said, he's talking about himself. He said, that I don't understand that bother me. Again, he said, it's not the things in the Bible that I don't understand that bothers me. He said, it's the things that I do understand that I'm not doing is it bothers me. Are you walking in love? Are you forgiving? Are you a giver? Are you going to church? Are you spending time with your father? I thought that was tremendous, and I started looking at that a little differently. I want to make sure that I do what I know God wants me to do. Amen? You could say it differently. You could say this. You could say it this week. I wrote this down. You could say it like this. It's not the parts of God's plan I don't understand that are stopping me. It's the parts of God's plan that I know, but I'm not doing, that are stopping me from reaching the next level. So we want to do what God has already asked us to do. What we know to do, walk in love, forgive, give, come to church, do the things that we know to do. Receive forgiveness of yourself. Uh, Jesus said it this way, who, he who is faithful in little will be given much. Jesus talks about a, a man who called his servants to him and said, look, I'm going to give you five talents. I'm going to give you two talents. I'm going to give you one talent. He said, here's five talents for you. Here's two talents for you. Here's one talent for you. I'm going to be gone for a long time, and I'm going to come back, and I'm going to see what you do. And he comes back, and the guy with the five talents has been faithful. He's been working the plan. He's been doing something with it. And he comes up to his master when he, the master comes back and says, look, I've done something. The five talents you gave me, I have turned them into ten talents. And I want you to listen to what, this is Jesus telling the story, what Jesus says of the man who, who had something to do, and he did it, and now the master comes back and he says in Matthew 25 and verse 21, he says, And the Lord said unto him, Well done, thou good and faithful servant. Thou have been faithful over a few things. I will make thee a ruler over many things. Enter thou into the joy of thy Lord. He's saying the more you have done, the more you're going to give. The more you fulfill God's plan, the more of God's plan you're going to get. The one with two talents, remember I said one got five and one got two and one got one talent. The one with two talents also came and said, look, you gave me two and I've turned them into four. And the master says again in Matthew 25, verse 23, listen to what he says. His Lord said unto him, well done, your good and faithful servant. Thou hast been faithful over a few things. I will make thee a ruler over many things. Enter into the joy of the Lord. So God is laying down, or Jesus is laying down a truth here. If you'll be faithful, you'll get more. So if you and I will follow God's plan that we know, he'll reveal more of his plan to us. If we are faithful to the plan that he'd already given us and we're following it, he will reveal more and more to us. We'll come and say, God, I I've done this. And he'll say, good, I'm going to give you more. See, the truth is, he who follows God's plan, more of God's plan will be revealed to that individual. I was asked not too long ago, how do you know it's the voice of God? Well, if, if we listen to God and do what he's already told us to do that's obvious, pretty soon we start to hear God's voice because God makes it clear to us, and we hear him more and more. So we start to do it, and God says, well done, thou good and faithful servant. I'm going to show you what else. I want to show you more of the plan I have for your life. In Matthew chapter 2 and verse 1, now we're going into the Christmas story. I want you to join me, if you would, on the overhead, and I want to read to you, again, about someone following the plan of God, and then God giving them more. It says here, now when Jesus was born in Bethlehem of Judea, in the days of Herod, the king, behold, there came wise men from the east to Jerusalem, saying, Where is he that is born king of the Jews? For we have seen his star in the east and are come to worship him. And when Herod the king had heard these things, he was troubled and all of Jerusalem with him. The reason he was troubled is because they were asking, Who is born king of the Jews? And Herod said, I'm king of the Jews. I don't like this. It goes on and says, And when he had gathered all the chief priests and scribes and all of the people together and demanded of them where this Christ should be born, and they said unto him, In Bethlehem of Judea. Now what's sad about this is these wise men knew where the Messiah should be born, but they weren't wise enough to go there. 
they weren't wise enough to do what they ought to have done. They're telling these other wise men, the, three, the, the wise men that came from the east, oh, he's in Bethlehem. These are wise men that knew where the Messiah should be born, but they never budged. They didn't even do. The other wise men did. In Bethlehem of Judea, for thus it is written of the prophet, uh, and thou, Bethlehem, the land of Judah, are not the least among the princes of Judah, for out of thee shall come a governor that shall rule my people. Then Herod, when he had privately called the wise men, inquired of them diligently what time the star appeared. Now this is important. He calls the wise men, he says, what time? How long ago did you see this star? Just remember that. We'll see that in a moment. What time did it appear? And he sent them to Bethlehem and said, Go and search diligently for the young child, and when you have found him, bring me word again that I, may, that I might come and worship him. He never planned on coming and worshiping Jesus. They had just told him there was a baby being born that was king of the Jews. He wanted to be king of the Jews, so he wanted to know where that baby was so he could go kill him. And then verse 9 says, And when they had heard the king, they departed, and lo, the star which they had saw in the east uh, went before them till it came and stood over where the child was. And when they saw the star, they rejoiced exceedingly with great joy. And when they were coming to the house, everybody say house. doesn't say manger. Remember that. They came into the house, it says. And when they saw the young child with Mary, the, uh, his mother, and fell down and worshipped him, and when they had opened their treasures, they presented unto him gold, frankincense, and myrrh. Now, what I want to say to you is this, and this is important. These wise men were doing what they really believed they were supposed to do. See, when you do what you're supposed to do, God will reveal even more to you. They came and they said, where is this, this one who's going to be born king of the Jews? They didn't know. They found out he's going to be born in Bethlehem, so they went on even further. And then they came. Now, history tells us, and the Bible is really what I'm talking about, tells us it could have been up to two years that they had been traveling to find this Messiah, to find this baby being born. They could have already traveled two years. That's a long time, two years. Have you ever heard something from God, like give and you give and you're waiting and waiting for God to give back to you and doesn't happen fast enough? Have you said, well, I gave him that offering and something hasn't come back yet? And a year goes by, another year goes by. Now you know how these wise men felt. They were following the star for up to two years. They were following the star. And they finally find out it's in Bethlehem. They come there. They go to the house. And what they do is they give gold, frankincense, and myrrh. Now, now listen, God's plans are way ahead of time. God plans way ahead of time. That's why God sees down for the future for you and sees what would be good for you to do right now. And he's trying to get you to do what he's trying to get you to do, not to hurt you, but to bless you. Remember, Satan's the taker. God's the giver. And God's wanting to bless you. Satan's wanting to hurt you. Satan's trying to get you to stop and not do what God wants you to do. God's trying to get you to do what he wants you to do because he sees the future and he wants to take you and get you blessed. Amen? Amen. So he's tell so he, so he, so he tells the wise men, so he tells the wise men, follow the star. They follow the star. They get there. They present gold, frankincense, and myrrh to this, this mother, Mary, to this baby, Jesus, and to Joseph. Now, why is that important? That's part of God's plan. That gold, frankincense, and myrrh, they tell us that we think about a little box because we've seen the pictures of gold, a little thing of myrrh, and a little thing of this and that. No, no. They probably had camels coming with them. They gave money to Jesus as an infant. And that money, some historians and some theologians believe that money is what carried him through a lot of his life. Is the money that he got right there at the beginning. So the plan for them to be there was important. Amen? The plan for them to be there was important. And thank God they followed the plan. I don't know what your plan, God has planned for you. I'm not sure what God has for me. But I do know this, I'm supposed to love others, I'm supposed to forgive others, I'm supposed to give, I'm supposed to come to church, I'm supposed to be a blessing, I know that, and as I do that, then I'm going to see down the road where God's going to lead me. Maybe I'm going to go and, and present a baby with something, and that baby's going to become a great human being. I don't know, but I know this, God has a plan for each one of us. Amen. Turn to somebody and say, God has a plan for you because you're a wise man or woman. Randy Sapita, Randy Sapita turned over to Gary and said, God has a plan for you because you're a wise guy. That's not what I ask you to say. I want you to see that the wise men, now watch this. This is where you start to see this. If you, knowledge within knowledge, wisdom within, knowledge uh, wisdom within wisdom, precept upon precept. Watch. They listen to God two years. 
They could have traveled, presented this finance that was needed for Jesus and his ministry. For moving from one place to another for his family. It was given by them. And because they fulfilled the plan or did what they knew to do, God gives them the next step or more of the plan in Matthew chapter 2 and verse 12. After they had presented gold, frankincense, and myrrh, God speaks to them again because they have already done what he's asked them to do. Now he reveals more of the plan to them. And he says, And being warned of God in a dream, they should not return to Herod. They departed unto their own country another way. Because they had listened to God and did the plan that they knew to do, when they got done doing what they knew to do, God said, I've got something else. Now, don't go back that way. God has something to tell you if you'll do what he's already told you. God has something he wants you to know if you'll do what he's already told you and you know. God is wanting you to do what you know to do so he can tell you that you don't know what to do. Amen? He's got something for us if we'll do it. Now, these are the wise men. They listened to God. They followed his plan. And more was given to them. You know, Jesus... Let me just tell you a few stories about Jesus quickly. But here, think about this. Jesus says to his, his mother comes to him and says, we're at this wedding, and they ran out of wine. And she says, they need wine. He says, it's not my time. She says, do something, boy. I'm your mama. Do something. That's what happened. And so he calls his disciples. He says, hey, go over there and get some water out of that well and fill up those pots. They go, what are you doing? Don't worry about what I'm doing. Just follow the plan. Well, what is the whole plan? Just follow the part of the plan you know. Well, what's the part of the plan we know? Get the water out of the well and put it in the pots. What's that got to do with your mama just said? Just do what I ask you to do. Get the water out of the well and put it in the pots. I'm not going to do it. No, they didn't do that. They said, okay, we'll do what you've told us to do. They've got the pot, took it over, Got the well water, filled the pots with water. I don't know why we're doing this. I don't know why I'm going to church. I don't know why I have to forgive people. I don't know why I have to give in the offering. I don't know why I have to read the Bible. I don't know why I have to do this. I don't know why God has me do it. This is stupid. Why? They could have been griping. I don't know, but they got the pots filled. And then he says, okay, now, take that container over there and dip in there and take it to the head honcho of the wedding. Why am I doing this? Just do what I ask you to do. Well, I, this is stupid. Fulfill, do the plan I'm telling you. What plan? First you had me pour water into pots. What's I got to do with wine? And now you ask me to get a cup and get it, that water out of that thing and take it to the head honcho? What's I got to do with your mama saying you need wine? And as they did it, as they followed the plan, they dipped in, okay, this is sounds stupid, but I'll follow your plan. More of the plan was revealed because as they started walking to the head honcho, they go, that smells like liquor. That smells like, yeah, that does, that smells, that smells like, here. Jesus said, I had the plan all along. I just needed you to do what I asked you to do. See, we don't know everything all the time. Maybe we're just filling the pot. We don't know it's going to turn to wine. Maybe we're just carrying it over here. Maybe we don't know it's going to get real good. Maybe we don't know, but God has a plan. If we'll just do what he's asked us to do, then he'll reveal more to us. Amen? Amen. Give God a hand clap. <laughs> Jesus, says, Jesus says, so they're hungry, huh? They go, Yeah. Thousands of them are hungry. What are we going to do? He goes, well, how much money you got? Go. He says, no, go, go in town, buy some food? No. I'll tell you what you do. Ask around, see who has some food. Well, this is stupid. What kind of an idea? Okay, and they find a boy with just a few loaves and some fish. He says, bring that over here. <sighs> here you go. All right. Now have them sit down in 50s and hundreds. Why, why are we going to have them sit down? They're hungry. Have them sit down. This is a dumb plan. No, have them sit down. They don't know that he's going to multiply the fish. They don't know what he's going to do. All they know is he's telling them to sit down. So they go and they go, the apostles, um, excuse me, I know you're hungry and miserable. I know your kids are hungry and whining and crying, but could you uh, 50 sit down over there? What are we doing? I don't know. Just sit down. Could you, 50 over there, sit down? What are we doing? Just sit down. I don't know, but I saw him turn water into wine, so if he's telling us to do something, we just follow his plan. Sit down, sit down, sit down, sit down. You're rocking the boat. Sit down. And they all sit down. And he took it. And he said, now I'm going to pray. He said, Father, I thank you. And they're going, what kind of a plan is that? And then he says, now pass this out. Pass what out? This. And they start passing it out. 
and it multiplies. And they pass it out. And it, multi- it doesn't multiply, and then it, it multiplies. Th- this is unbelievable. I'm doing the plan that God told me to do. I had him set down, and now I'm part of the plan. Now this is tremendous. If I wouldn't have had him set down, there may not have been a miracle. Had I not checked that little boy to see if he had something like he asked me to do, maybe it wouldn't have happened. And maybe if I wouldn't have had him set down, and maybe if I wouldn't have reached in, it wouldn't have been there. But because... I asked for the little boy like he asked me to do because I brought it to him like he asked me to do because I had him set down like they asked me to do. I didn't understand everything. I never knew there'd be 12 baskets left over of food. What a plan he had, but I only knew this much. See, God will ask us to do things sometimes that makes no sense to us at all. Makes no sense. Wise men say we already gave frankincense and myrrh. He says, I don't want you going back that way. Go another way. Why? Why was God telling the wise men who had already followed the plan for two years to not go back the same way they had come? Because God knew Herod, had they gone back the same way, was going to get them and say, okay, where is he at? And he would go kill the Messiah. God has a plan. You may not understand it. God has a plan for your life, Emerson. God has a plan for your life, Sarah. Uh, God has a plan for your life. God has a plan for your life. Turn to somebody and say, God has a plan for Emerson's life. <laughs> My grandson's over here. I just gave it. God has a plan for your life. It may not make sense, Savannah, when it's asked, but it does make sense to God because he sees down the road, Olivia. He knows what's going on along far way in advance, doesn't he, Carol? He does know. He knows what's going on. So when he asks you to do something, just do it. Turn to somebody and say, I'm going to do it. Amen. There's a story, the Christmas story goes on. Joseph, you remember the story about Joseph, you, you know, the, the, the husband of Mary? Joseph is told, don't be afraid to take Mary as your wife, because that which is birthed in here is of the Holy Ghost. So he says, I don't understand this, but if that's your plan, I'm going to marry her. And he marries her. He has to go to Bethlehem, and he, they have this child there in Bethlehem. These wise men show up. Can you imagine? All of a sudden, these wise men show up with these camels and present gold, frankincense, and myrrh. All this money is now available, all this myrrh, all this... Gold, frankincense, and myrrh. They're worshiping. You're going, wow, what a plan. I would have never planned this. And then because he's been, he's listened to God, because Joseph, the father, has listened to God, God gives him more. When he didn't understand, God said, marry her, and he marries her. But now God gives him more. I want you to to watch this. It says in Matthew chapter 2, verse 13. Matthew 2, starting with verse 13. And when they had departed, behold, the angel of the Lord appeared unto Joseph in a dream, saying, Arise, and take up the young child and his mother, and flee unto Egypt. And be thou there until I bring thee word, for Herod will seek the young child to destroy him. It's important that we know this, that Joseph had started listening to God, and because he had started listening to God and took Mary as his wife, God continued to guide him and reveal more of the plan. He said, you need to go to Egypt right now. And Joseph, because he had already started listening to God, doing what God had asked him to do, he, fo- he did the plan that God asked him to do. Joseph goes, I'm supposed to marry Mary? Okay, I'll marry Mary. I'm supposed to flee to Egypt? Okay, I'll flee to Egypt. And because he, he went to Egypt, it says that Herod, now watch this, Herod gets mad. And Herod goes to Bethlehem. And he kills all the children from two years of age on down. Because he says, those wise men told me that they first saw that star two years ago. And I want to kill that child who is supposed to be king of the Jews. So he goes into Bethlehem looking for Jesus. And he has all the children from two years of age on down killed. Had Joseph not had learned to flow with the plan of God, Jesus, our Savior, would have been killed then. But because Joseph had learned to go with the plan of God, even though you may not understand it always, 
Jesus was saved so he could save us. Amen? Amen. Who can you save and who can you help if you'll simply listen to God? Who is hungry that you can feed if you'll simply listen to God? Who is it that needs help if you'll just simply listen to God? You may not always understand why God is telling you to do something, but man, let's do it. The Christmas story says the wise men listened to God and they blessed Jesus and they were blessed and saved themselves and they saved Jesus by not letting him get killed. And now Joseph has listened to God and now he follows the only part of the plan he knows and he leaves and goes to Egypt and now Jesus is saved again. What is there that God's asking you to do? And you don't understand all the ramifications and what could happen if you don't do it, but Jesus is telling you to do it and I'm telling you, do it, do it, do it, do it, do it. Because God's got a plan for your life, and he's always a giver. He's not a taker. And there's always somebody there wanting to take from you, wanting to take from you, wanting to steal from you, wanting to kill you, wanting to destroy you. And he's trying to get you not to do the plan of God. But if you'll do the plan of God, God got a future for you. God wants to bless you. God loves you. Amen? Give God a hand clap. So the Christmas, so the Christmas story basically just tells us that we need, we need to follow God's plan. And if we want to know more of God's plan, we just follow the plan we already know. God wants us to, to love one another. So let me ask you, are we loving one another? I know it sounds silly. See, Pastor, you don't understand. I want to know a five-year plan. Here it is. Are you loving one another? I want to know what's going to happen in my life. Are you forgiving people? Pastor, no, no, no. You don't understand. I want to know what college. Uh, let me ask you this. Are you a giver? You don't understand, Pastor. I want to know what's the end of my life going to be like. Well, I just want to ask you something. Are you going to church? Pastor, I, it's not the things you don't know that are stopping you. It's the things you do know that you're not doing. And then the other things won't be revealed. What happens if Joseph had never married Mary? What happens if the wise men had never followed the star? What happens if the, the, the apostles had never, ever put the water in the pot? What happens if they had never have found the fish and the bread? What happens if they had never said, sat down, sat down, sat down, sat down? What happens if they had never started passing out what looked like a meager amount and then it grew? What happened... If you and I don't love others, forgive others, or give, or come to church, what happens is when God tells us to do something and we don't do it? You know, there's a man that I studied after. I liked his name. Was, it's kind of an interesting name, Smith. His last name was Wigglesworth. I don't know how they got that name, but his last name was Wigglesworth. And Smith Wigglesworth had made a commitment to God that every day of his life, he felt God had told him this as a plan of his life, every day of your life I want you to bring someone to the Lord, lead them to the Lord. And Smith Wigglesworth had such great miracles in his life. Blind eyes were opened, dead people were raised, all kinds of things took place in this man's ministry. And he accredited to the fact that he just worked the plan that God told him to do, making sure he did the first thing, and that is to get someone saved every day. One day, he had gotten home. He had done a meeting. He had gotten home, and he's taking his clothes off. He got into bed, and he lays down in bed. All of a sudden, he remembers, I didn't lead anybody to the Lord today. And that was the original plan God gave me. He got back up, put his clothes back on, got on a, 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 a trolley that was going, and he started riding the trolley, waiting and waiting. And finally, somebody got on the trolley, and he looked over and said, God, is that him? And he said, God said, that's him. And went over and said, uh, hi, my name is Smith Wigglesworth. I want to talk to you about my Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. And led the man to the Lord. And mighty miracles kept following Smith Wigglesworth. What is it that God's asking us to do? And he's got a plan, a future for us. Why don't you bow your heads if you would, please. Heavenly Father, in the name of our Lord and our Savior, Jesus Christ, I know you got a plan, a good plan, because you're a giver and not a taker. I know you want to bless us because you're a blesser and not a curser. I know that you're a good God, your word tells that. And Father, we know that what you have in store for us would have to be good because you are a good God. Father, we don't know all of your plan, but would you reveal what it is you'd want us to do this week or even this day? 
Is there somebody that needs something? We ought to give it to them. Is there somebody who just needs to know the Lord you want us to witness to? Is there somebody that needs to best just have an arm around them and be encouraged? Is there someone who just needs a word that tells them that they're not a loser? Is there somebody that I've been fighting with that I need to lay that down? Is there somebody? Show me, Lord. I'll do it. Whatever the next step, whatever it is, Lord, I'll take that step. I'll be that giver. I'll, I may not understand. Like maybe Joseph didn't understand. Maybe I'll not understand. Maybe like the wise men originally didn't understand. Maybe I'll not understand like the apostles didn't really understand. Why are we filling these water pits? Whatever it is, Lord. Whatever it is. If you're here today and you're saying, you know what? I see it. I see that I need to do the very small things that God has already shown me in his word for me to do. And then I know he'll reveal the larger things. And you're saying, today I want to make a commitment to God that I'm going to start doing the things that God is showing me to do. And I believe he'll show me more. Just raise your hand and say, I'm believing that. I'm believing God today. I'm going to do the things that God has already shown me to do. And I know God's going to show me even greater things. I'm going to ask you to say these words with your hands raised up. Heavenly Father, I commit to you to do the things that you ask me to do. And I believe you that you'll reveal more of your plan for my life. I thank you. In Jesus' name, amen. Why don't you give God a hand clap, will you please? Praise God forevermore. God is good and his mercy endures forever. God is good and his mercy endures forever. In case you wonder, some of the names I was calling off when I was talking, I was just uh, teasing some people that I love uh, dearly. Uh, uh, the first one I mentioned was Emerson. Could you please stand up, Emerson? This is my grandson, Emerson. The next, the next one I, I mentioned was Savannah. Could you please stand up? This is my granddaughter, Savannah. The next one I mentioned was Olivia. And we, could you please stand up, Olivia? This is my granddaughter, Olivia. And, and the next one I mentioned was Ella. Did I mention Ella? Oh, I'm sorry. Ella. Could you please stand up? This is my beautiful granddaughter, Ella. And, and, and uh, the mama of all of them is my, my daughter, my little KK. You stand up. I love you. I'm glad, I'm glad you did that plan, you know, of, of getting married and having children, because I got me four great grandkids. They're great, man. God bless you. Thanks for being here, guys. Uh, God is good, amen. <laughs> Let me pray for you. Let me pray for you. Some people are saying, what's the plan for Good News Church? Well, right now, we're going to do exactly what God told us to do. And God's going to show us more. Amen. Have you found any buildings? Oh, we found all kinds of buildings. We haven't found the building, but we're going to find it because we're going to do what, exactly what God tells us to do every time. Amen. In the meantime, we're going to have services. We're going to win people to the Lord. We're going to pray for people. We're going to love people. We're going to forgive people. We're going to preach the word of God. And God's going to bless us and give more and more and more and more of his plan. And I'm not worried because it's God, not us. Amen. Uh, reach over and grab somebody's hand, if you would, please. Or some people don't like their hands held, so why don't you grab them by the throat? I'm And let's choke out a blessing. Heavenly Father, I thank you that you had a plan that we'd be here today. It was your plan that we would hear this message today. It was your plan that we would hear wisdom and knowledge within knowledge. Father, we thank you in this time in our life, we hear something in the Christmas story we may have never even seen before. It was your plan to reveal it to us today, to challenge us, encourage us. I thank you, Father. I thank you for everyone that is here. I thank you that they came here into this beautiful building you've allowed us to use. Why we're here, we don't really know, but we know it's part of your plan. And we're going to continue to do what you've asked us to do. We thank you, Father God, for each and every person that's here. We ask you to reveal more and more to them. We ask you to bless them. And as we end this year, Heavenly Father, I ask that this year would 
uh, turn out to be just a pale compared to the great blessings of this next year coming up. I ask you to bless, encourage, lift up, strengthen, and I thank you for revealing your plan more and more as we follow your plan. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, why, don't you, why don't you stand, if you would, please. We're going to pray, and then he's, he's going to play some music, then he's going to pray, and you're dismissed. I'll see you tomorrow at 6 o'clock to 7 o'clock, one hour. I believe in God of oh Father. I believe in God the Son. I believe in the Holy Spirit. Our God is really in one. I believe in the resurrection and we will rise again. For I believe in the name of Jesus. I believe in God of oh Father. I believe in Christ the Son. I believe in the Holy Spirit, our God is free in one. I believe in the resurrection, and we will rise again. For I believe in the name of Jesus. For I believe, for I believe in the name of Jesus. I believe, for I believe in the name of Jesus. honor and the glory in Jesus' name.